This narration is a very personal history of the library and information science programs at UNC. Over the years, I have been privileged to meet every one of the 13 deans that the school has had, from Dr. Wilson and Dean Akers to Dean Marcinini. The pictures that you will be seeing represent people and events over the 90 years that the school has been in existence. You understand that I have not been around for all 90 years, but I have had some experience with a considerable amount of the school's history. These remarks were originally delivered as the 2011 Lucille Kelling Henderson Lecture, included as a part of the 80th anniversary celebration. I'm very honored and delighted to present those revised and updated remarks as a part of this 90th anniversary celebration. The 80th anniversary coincided with new leadership in the school. Having Gary Marcianini as our dean since then has given the school inspired leadership that has taken it to new heights. I'm grateful for the support that he and his wonderful faculty and staff have given me. When the Dean invited me to give the Lucille Kelling Henderson Lecture in 2011, I immediately declined on the basis that I'd given the first one in 1991. He soon disabused me of the notion that there could be only one opportunity to honor the legacy and memory of this gracious lady. Now I am given that opportunity once again for a third time. I must admit that 2022 will be a special year for me. It will mark the 60th anniversary of my graduation from what was then known as the School of Library Science. This year, 2021, also marks the 50th anniversary of my return to Chapel Hill in 1971 from Indiana University as a newly minted PhD and assistant professor. What an adventure I was about to begin. After I got over my initial reservations about accepting the Dean's invitation in 2011, I can't tell you how much fun I had in working with this topic. I have derived equal pleasure in 2021. Before I get started, I want to make some acknowledgments. The late Wanda Monroe for her wonderful archive of pictures and her cheerful and prompt assistance. Stephanie Kretz for being my cheerleader and keeping me focused. Rebecca Varga for using her campus contacts to locate so many materials for me. And most of all, Susan Sylvester, she who can do all things. And of course, Gail Douglas Johnson, my former assistant dean at the University of South Carolina, who makes up for my technological ineptitude and who helped me put together both the 2011 and 2021 presentations. I am deeply indebted to my spouse, John Upson, who found and retrieved the original Word document from 2011, which greatly facilitated the revision. When I entered the school in early June of 1960, Mrs. Henderson was dean. She retired on the last day of that month. Now I refuse to believe that there was any cause and effect on my part. Early on in our library school careers, each new student had an individual counseling session, an introduction to the school with the dean. I have a vivid memory of donning a coat and tie, which was not my usual attire. The picture you see is my actual application photo to the school. 
We would then be escorted into Mrs. Henderson's office by her assistant, Jean Freeman. You will hear much more about Miss Freeman later. Mrs. Henderson would welcome the new students to the program and discuss some of the things that we might expect. In those days, the program was still 48 semester hours, as it is now, and it then included a formal thesis and both written and oral exams. This was prior to the change to 36 hours that took place the year after we graduated. More about the change back to 48 semester hours later. After discussing our interests, the dean would then assign us an advisor. I was assigned to Robert Miller. His was the single greatest influence on my later decisions to enter library education and subsequently to return to Chapel Hill as an assistant professor in 1971. He is another of my personal giants. Although my formal association with Mrs. Henderson was brief, it certainly set the tone for two happy years of library school. After her retirement in 1964, she began a new career as the office manager for her son's architectural firm. There would be occasional sightings in restaurants or in downtown Chapel Hill. She didn't forget a face, and there would always be a cheery hello and time for a brief visit. As I thought about a topic that would commemorate our school in its 80th year, I reflected on the extraordinary run of number one rankings that the school has enjoyed. I realize that rankings are subjective and that not everyone places a lot of faith in them. At the very least, though, rankings serve as an indicator of quality and respect, and I am pleased that our fellow schools recognize our quality. But rankings are achieved on the basis of a firm foundation and amazing individuals. I plan to touch on the important people who have built our school. Many of you know that I am a basketball fan. Nay, a UNC basketball fan. And every time the Tar Heels climb to the top of the rankings, I'm filled with pride. I may live in South Carolina, but my season tickets were in the Smith Center. I have that same pride about Sills and the years that we have been so highly ranked. It has indeed been a remarkable run of national championships in information and library science. We didn't set out to achieve the number one ranking, but like the UNC basketball team's national championships, it certainly doesn't hurt that we have had them in Sills. We are indeed recognized as one of the premier schools of information and library science. I then reflected on the leaders, the movers and shakers, if you will, who laid the groundwork. It seems clear to me that we have had a succession of giants who set in place an awesome infrastructure. Although some of them, such as Wilson and Akers, Henderson and Holly, and Moran and Marcinini, may be better known to us than others, each of our thirteen deans has added to the strong foundation and reputation that the school enjoys. So it is now disclaimer time. 1. Although I spend considerable time on the deans, my definition of giants isn't limited to deans. They are the head coaches. They recruit the faculty, staff, and students to carry out the programs. We mustn't forget that there is considerable competition in academia to recruit the very best, just as there is in athletics. 
Danes are the leaders, the planners, and the organizers. Their game days are every day. I have known or met every dean that the school has had. After being a student under Deans Henderson and Frary, I worked for six of them. First as visiting lecturer or summer school instructor under Deans Calp, Frary, and Sedlow. Then as an assistant professor under Deans Carpenter and Holly. And finally, as associate dean to deans Holly and Daniel. I have considered the later deans since I left in 1986 as my friends and colleagues, and I have enjoyed my association with all of them. What a treat! Two, although much will be said about the deans, my definition of giants includes faculty, staff, students, and alumni, and I plan to recognize some of these very important supporters and perhaps introduce you to some unfamiliar names who have played a very important role over the years. If I have omitted one of your personal giants, it is, as the Book of Common Prayer says, a sin of omission, not commission. Three, this is neither a traditional nor a comprehensive history of SILS. My focus is on people and their roles in contributing to the development and success of the school. This is very much a personal look at the school, drawing on my perceptions, particularly during the 60 or so years that I have been involved. I will attempt to show relationships and how the people have been interrelated and how they overlap the different eras in the school's history. I have also had a great time drawing pictures from the school's archives. Four, for a comprehensive overview of the school, visit the school's website that contains the SILS timeline. It has been recently revised, updated, and expanded. The early years, under the triumvirate of Wilson, Akers, and Henderson, have been well chronicled. Our own Louis Round Wilson scholar, Bob Martin, a Sills Ph.D. graduate, has given insights into Dr. Wilson's impact on not just librarianship, but on every aspect of university life. Then there's a wonderful essay prepared by Professor David Carr for the 75th anniversary of the school, which describes life in the school in those early days. It gives insights into what was happening and how the school has related to the broader world of library and information science. Although we primarily remember Dr. Wilson as the university librarian from 1901 through 1932, and as the founder and first director of the school, we should be aware that he had a much broader impact on the campus. He founded the Alumni Review. He was instrumental in the founding of the Institute for Research in Social Sciences. He established the UNC Press and served as its first director. And last but not least, he was trusted advisor to many presidents and other faculty and administrators of the university. During his time as university librarian, Dr. Wilson had a deep and abiding interest in teaching others about the use and importance of libraries. As early as 1903, he began to develop courses in library methods for the university's summer session. Eventually, the successful summer courses 
began to be offered during the fall and spring semesters. In the 1920s, he began seriously to push for the establishment of a full-fledged program of library education. Although his early efforts to establish a school of library science were not successful, he kept his ideas in front of the university administrators. He came to realize that to start a full-fledged library school, he would have to obtain funding from outside sources. He had long been active in the work of the American Library Association's Board of Education for Librarianship, serving as chair during the early 1920s, and this work provided him direct contact with the Carnegie Corporation and other funding sources. Success came in February of 1929 in the form of a grant of $100,000 from the Carnegie Corporation to establish the library school at UNC. At this same time, the building that bears his name today was in the final stages of completion. During this time, Dr. Wilson was recruiting, planning, organizing, and setting the stage for the school to open in 1931. With the completion of the new library, the school was assigned quarters on the fourth floor. Here that is the top floor. For almost 40 years until 1970, the school would remain there, from time to time gaining extra offices but not much additional space. You see the school's study hall, a large open area in the school's library. The small, cramped lounge was across the hall. The administrative offices were in the back of the floor. The small, high windows on the fourth floor gave access to a parapet. A favorite pastime of us students at night was to climb out the windows onto the parapet. That was a particularly great place to watch events such as fireworks from Keenan Stadium on July 4th. The school officially began classes on September 17, 1931, a date that was commemorated on September 25th of this year with a homecoming celebration that officially opened the 90th anniversary celebration. The initial faculty of the school consisted of four individuals, Director Louis Round Wilson, Susan Gray Akers, Nora Bust, and Donald Coney. They were joined the next year by Lucille Kelling. While we are observing the 90th anniversary of the founding of the school, I would also propose that we're observing the 118th year of library education offerings at UNC. From Dr. Wilson's early summer school offerings to the establishment of credit courses in the university's curriculum to the formal establishment of the school, we have been offering an important and valuable service to North Carolina to the Southeast, and to the nation. At the conclusion of the school's first year, Dr. Wilson was called to the University of Chicago to serve as dean of the graduate library school there. He spent 10 years there, providing exemplary leadership to the field and to the university. When he retired in 1942, he returned to Chapel Hill, where he taught in the school until 1948. He died in 1979 at the age of 102. On his 100th birthday, he was honored with a celebration that brought together a national who's who 
in library and information science. When he left for Chicago, the university named Dr. Susan Gray Akers as acting director, then director, and subsequently dean. I believe she was the first woman dean on the UNC campus. During her 22-year tenure as the leader of the school, the longest of any of our deans so far, there was a period of great stability in the school, such as we are currently experiencing. Dr. Akers had received the fourth PhD in library science in the country from the University of Chicago. It was only the second PhD for a woman. She was an extraordinary leader who immediately set about obtaining accreditation for the school. This was achieved at the earliest date possible, and since 1934, the school's programs have had continuing accreditation. In 1931, she sought and received a second $100,000 grant from the Carnegie Corporation. This ensured the continuing existence of the school until the university was able to provide funding from state funds in the late 1930s. One of her more amazing accomplishments came when the North Carolina legislature authorized in 1939 a professional school in library science at what is now North Carolina Central University. Dr. Akers agreed to assist, and she served as dean of both schools until 1946. She retired in 1954 after 23 years as a beloved faculty member and admired administrator. Dr. Akers continued to teach until 1959. She had a long and well-deserved retirement until she died in 1984 at the age of 94. Dr. Ed Holly remarked that she, quote, established the foundations upon which the school's subsequent reputation has been built, end of quote. The extraordinary combination of Dr. Wilson's vision and Dr. Aker's ability to develop that vision gave the school unprecedented leadership during its formative years. The lady whom we honor today, Lucille Kelling Henderson, joined the faculty in 1932 and was considered a master teacher by all who had the good fortune to be in one of her classes. When Dina, Dean Akers retired in 1954, Mrs. Henderson became dean and held that post until she retired in 1960. During her deanship, the school abandoned the bachelor's degree in library science for a Master of Library Science program, which was becoming the norm in library schools. She was also instrumental in the start of the Epsilon chapter of Beta Phi Mu in 1958. Mrs. Henderson's death occurred in 1990 at the age of 95. These three individuals gave the school extraordinary leadership for almost 30 years. One of my regrets is that each had stopped teaching by the time I entered the school and I had no classes with any of them. I did, however, have many opportunities to meet them. When I was a visiting lecturer in the 1960s, Dr. Wilson's office was just down the hall from mine. He was very kind to a very young and wet-behind-the-ears faculty member. Ed Holly took me to see Miss Akers on a regular basis. 
and Mrs. Henderson was often sighted in downtown Chapel Hill. In the 1960s, the school began a period of short-term and acting deans. Although four different individuals occupied the dean's office, each made significant contributions in very different ways. This was by no means a holding pattern. Progress continued. Carlisle Frary was acting dean from 1960 to 1964. He had been a faculty member since 1954, after serving a period as assistant librarian at Duke University. During his deanship, he supervised a major curriculum revision. The master's program was reduced to 36 semester hours from the 48 hours previously required. The master's thesis became a master's paper and the oral exam requirement was dropped. This program would remain in place for the next 20 years. Dean Frary left UNC in 1964 to become the assistant dean and senior lecturer at Columbia University's School of Library Service. His untimely death took place in 1976 at the age of 58. He was always genial, friendly, and a character in class. I had research methods with him and his classes were always lively. Margaret Cowell, a longtime faculty member who anchored the program and worked with children and young people, was named acting dean in 1964, and she held that position through 1967. She was a pragmatic, eternally cheerful, and very effective acting dean. However, she made even greater contributions to the school when Ed Holly was dean. More to come on Margaret. Walter Sedlow's appointment as dean in 1967 added a new dimension to the school. Prior to coming to the school, he had held joint appointments in the university's computer science and sociology department. Dr. Sedlow's deanship marked the beginning of the school's efforts in computer-related activities for the librarian. During his tenure, the first courses in data processing for librarians were offered. I hold the distinction of teaching the first course in 1968. It was called Machine Methods for Librarians and it was very high-tech. The key punch and card sorter constituted our major tools. The first full-time faculty appointment in this area was made when Martin Dillon joined the faculty in 1969. He was an extremely effective teacher who remained on the faculty until he went to OCLC in 1987. It was during Dr. Sedlow's deanship that Manning Hall underwent renovation in preparation for the school's move from the top floor of Wilson Library in 1970. The law school had previously been housed in Manning. Before the renovation was completed, however, he resigned to accept a position at the University of Kansas at Lawrence. We're indebted to him for getting us Manning Hall. Professor Raymond Carpenter became acting dean in 1970 and presided over the move to Manning Hall, which was completed the day before registration began in the 1970 fall semester. He came to the school as a master's student in 1956 and subsequently received a doctorate in sociology from UNC. 
He had become a lecturer in the school in 1960 and joined the permanent faculty as associate professor in 1968. When I was a student, I had several courses with him. A prodigious researcher, he contributed several pioneering studies. Ray will always be one of my personal giants because he appointed me as an assistant professor in 1971. Thank you, Ray. We see Manning Hall in all its glory. Although four individuals served as dean or acting dean during this 11-year period, it was still a period of innovation and forward movement. Among other highlights, there was major program revision, the addition of computers and libraries to the curriculum, and the move to Manning Hall. If you never visited the fourth floor of Wilson Library, in the cramped quarters of the school, you can't properly appreciate what Manning Hall meant to the program. Now the stage was set for the arrival in 1972 of Dr. Edward G. Holly, Director of Libraries at the University of Houston. As a successful university librarian, with little prior experience in library science education, it brought a new and different perspective to the school. It was during his deanship that the school began more external activities. His reputation and the respect he had from the library work laid the groundwork for an added dimension to the school's programs. Shortly after his arrival in Chapel Hill, he was asked to be a candidate for president of the American Library Association. He consulted with the faculty as to the feasibility of his candidacy. I believe everyone thought it would be a win-win situation for the school, and we encouraged him to move ahead. Ed very wisely considered what adjustments might need be needed internally to compensate for his absence over what was basically a three-year period. He already had in place Gene Freeman, the assistant to the dean, who had been a faculty member at the school since 1941. If ever there was a stability figure, it was Jean. Her knowledge of the alumni and students, her network across campus, and her institutional memory were phenomenal. To compliment Jean, he named Margaret Kalp, an earlier acting dean, as the school's first assistant dean. With Margaret and Jean as his leadership team, he was able to carry out his ALA duties and still remain intimately involved in the school's activities. Jean and Margaret are two of the unsung heroes of the school who are personal giants of mine. They were my close friends and they looked after the new kid on the faculty. Ed's ALA presidency was in 1974. Amazingly, he was able to maintain those duties and still ensure that the school was moving ahead. During this early period of his deanship, three major activities were introduced in the school. The block, the extended program, and the EPA internships. A new and innovative library school had begun at the University of South Carolina in 1970, and under Dean Wayne Yenowin, that school developed a comprehensive 12-hour program of integrated introduction to librarianship, jointly taught by all the faculty. In the early 1970s, Ed took us to USC to visit and view classes 
and to talk with faculty and students. Here Les Ashheim and I are talking with Associate Dean Bill Summers, who became Dean at USC in 1976. He was a future Dean at Florida State University and a president of ALA. We were intrigued by what we saw, and we came home to develop our own version of South Carolina's Pro-Sem, or Professional Seminar. Professor Doralyn Hickey chaired the committee that planned the new program, and in 1974, the block as we called it was introduced. As you might expect with all the faculty involved, there was some tricky scheduling, and a di different faculty member served as the chair of the block each year. My year was in 1976, and it presented a Damascus Road experience for me. I had been convinced that I wanted to stay in the classroom, but I was also intrigued by the administrative side. Administration and Ed Holly won out. The block put the introductory courses into perspective with each other. Since all the new students were in class with each other every day, the block presented tremendous opportunities for socialization, not only for the students, but also for the faculty. Another of Ed's innovations was the extended program concept. In 1963, the school had reduced the program to 36 semester hours. Now in the 1970s, several major schools were moving into 48 semester hour programs. Ed championed this move, and the faculty approved it in 1981. The school had previously sponsored a national conference on the move to an extended program, which showcased the programs of a number of schools, including South Carolina and Drexel. The most enduring legacy of Ed Steenship may well have been the development of the Environmental Protection Agency internships. In the early 1970s, the EPA slashed funding for the EPA library in the Research Triangle Park. In order to maintain services, the library approached Dean Holly and the school. Professor Herman Hinkle had recently retired as director of the John Curar Library in Chicago and had moved to Chapel Hill. Ed enlisted his services in planning the school's approach, and a creative plan was devised. With the librarian, Libby Smith, as the supervisor, and Dr. Hinkle as the school's representative, a contract was received for the school to provide library services, utilizing a number of student interns beginning in May of 1975. This plan has paid tremendous benefits for hundreds of students through the years, and library services were maintained and enhanced for the EPA. The 25th and 40th anniversaries of the program have been feted and celebrated. The, pro the contract flourishes today some 46 years after it began. In spite of the successful program changes that he either initiated or supported, I think that Ed's finest accomplishments in the school involved his faculty recruitment. Early on in his deanship, he added Mary Kingsbury, and the beloved Susan Steinfurst as important additions to the program of work with children and young people. There were several senior faculty appointments 
which made it possible for the school to plan and implement the doctoral program. In 1972, Haynes McMullen came to the school from Indiana University. A historian of great renown, Haynes was a major addition to the faculty in humanities and history. He had been my advisor and mentor at Indiana, and I was delighted to be able to welcome him to UNC. In 1974, Lester Ashheim of University of Chicago and ALA fame was invited by Ed to join the faculty. I well remember one peaceful afternoon when most of the faculty were in our offices. There arose a great clatter in the halls of the second floor, and Ed was jumping in glee to tell us, Ashheim is coming! Ashheim is coming. Les chaired the planning group for the doctoral program. In his quiet, unassuming, and efficient manner, he steered us through the planning process and into the implementation of the program. Another senior appointment occurred in 1976 when Robert Broadus of Northern Illinois University became a member of the faculty. Bob's major strengths were in collection development and bibliography. With his addition, we had a complete complement of full professors for the first time in many years. Bud Gamby, a longtime faculty member in media, was our other full professor. With the collective strengths and experience of our senior faculty, we were well positioned to implement our new doctoral program. In the fall of 1977, we admitted five students of high quality, Brian Nielsen, Delmas Williams, David Jensen, and on the front row, Joanne Bell and Arlene Taylor. This is Haynes McMullen with early doctoral students. In 1980, Joanne Hardison Bell received the school's first doctoral degree. And as they say in Hollywood, the rest is history. Indeed, I later appointed four of our PhD recipients as faculty at the University of South Carolina. The school's 50th anniversary was held with great fanfare in 1981. Ed delighted in celebrations, and this was a great one. This was, I believe, the first major observance of one of the school's anniversaries. There was an evening program with greetings from the chancellor and messages from many dignitaries and organizations. A highlight of the evening was remembrances by five alumni from each of the five decades. The first five of the school's Distinguished Alumni Awards were made that night. They went to Eunice Query, Chair of the Library Science Program at Appalachian State University, Mary Elizabeth Poole, Head of Documents at North Carolina State University, Emerson Greenaway, Director of the Free Library of Philadelphia, Herman Fussler, Librarian of the University of Chicago, and William Powell, Distinguished North Carolina Historian and the Head of the North Carolina Collection at Wilson Library. The next afternoon, a reception in Dean Aker's honor was held in the school's library. She attended and was greeted by a large number of alumni and friends of the school. Deans Henderson, Calp, and Carpenter were also in attendance. Ed was in his element at both celebrations. In 1977, Margaret Calp and Jean Freeman had looked forward to retirement. 
Together, they represented more than 65 years of knowledge about the school. I thought of them, along with Ed, as the school's brain trust. The real brain trust, however, must include Dr. Wilson and Dean Akers, Ed's longtime advisors. They are shown here with Jean, Margaret, and Ed. Ed developed a new support team. Francis McCoy Howard had worked with Jean Freeman as office manager since 1964 and had already been working closely with Ed. She became assistant to the dean. Margaret Kalp had given the school extraordinary service, first as a faculty member, then as acting dean, and finally as Ed's assistant dean. I was invited to move into that position. So on January 15, 1977, the transition took place. With Margaret's retirement in 1977, Ed recruited Marilyn Miller to continue Margaret's work with children and young people. Marilyn joined the faculty in 1977 among her many contributions was a field-based master's program. This was offered to the school system in Portsmouth, Virginia, and it began in 1981. This was the school's first, and so far as I know, only effort to offer our master's degree program in another state, or indeed off campus. The school had offered a few courses off campus at several North Carolina locations, but never the entire degree. Marilyn became the school's third president of the American Library Association. Dr. Wilson had held that post in 1935. Ed Holly in the early 70s and now, as her campaign slogan stated, it's Miller time, and indeed it was. Her presidency took place in 1992. She had become director of the library education program at UNC Greensboro in 1987. During Ed's deanship, he successfully nominated two of the school's distinguished alumni for the university's Distinguished Alumni Award. So far as I know, they're the only two alumni from the school ever to be so honored. The first was Paige Ackerman, university librarian from UCLA, shown here with Deans Henderson and Holly. The second was Herman Fussler, university librarian from the University of Chicago. When Evelyn Daniel became dean in 1985, she brought tremendous energy to the program. It was her vision and determination that the school's technological skills would be improved. No, not improved, but initiated. There already was a specialization in computers and libraries, but the faculty, staff, and students had little or no opportunity to gain computer experience. Evelyn fixed that. She brought in a technology coordinator, established computer labs, and provided the faculty and staff with computers. She also provided the faculty and staff instruction in the use of the new toys. I am grateful to this day that she urged my assistant, Jerry Compton, and me to go to Durham Tech and start the process of becoming technologically apt. Jerry far outshone me on that score. Evelyn did the nuts and bolts of computerizing the faculty and staff, and she made extinct the position of faculty secretary. I shall never forget the first time I heard Evelyn using the modem in her office. 
which was two doors away from mine. I had no idea what that very loud dial tone was and whether we were under siege or not. She set the tone and set about to bring us all into her fold. It was during her deanship that the name of the school changed. The former School of Library Science became the School of Information and Library Science, or as we refer to it today, SILS. To further underscore the importance of the new name, the faculty developed and approved two tracks in the school, Information Science and Library Science. Each is now a master's degree program accredited by the American Library Association. While Evelyn was dean, another retirement that impacted on the school's institutional memory took place. Frances McCoy Howard, who had been associated with the school for more than 20 years, retired. She was succeeded by Jerry Compton, who had been my assistant and Durham Tech classmate. Jerry worked with several of the deans before her own retirement. This was another loss for our institutional memory. Sadly, Evelyn Daniel died in 2019. Barbara Moran succeeded Evelyn as dean in 1990. She had been recruited by Ed in 1981. As assistant dean, I worked with Barbara on her orientation to the school. I advised her that her first activities needed to be a visit to the Human Resources Office to get set up with insurance and payroll, and a visit to the ticket office to get on the list for basketball tickets. Not necessarily in that order. During her tenure, the first international programs were initiated at Oxford University and in Prague. These successful programs have grown and continued and expanded. Barbara also made a very important faculty appointment, Dr. Fred Kilgore, the founder of OCLC. Under her leadership, the school's Board of Visitors, formerly the school's advisory board, was reconstituted and continues in that form today. It has been my honor to be a longtime member of that board. The first undergraduate minors in information science matriculated in the school in 1998, thus setting the stage for today's undergraduate degree. Barbara's responsibilities as dean included an increased focus on fundraising. This was true of the entire university. At this point, the school's first development officer, Melissa Kane, was appointed. As part of the Bicentennial Capital Campaign, they set a goal of $1 million and achieved it. This was not a small feat in those days. Oh yes, among her many achievements as dean, she continued to teach to the delight of her classes, and to be a very outstanding researcher. When Ed Holly stepped down as dean in 1985, I told him that he had made many excellent and distinguished faculty appointments who had made so many contributions to the school. I also told him that I thought Barbara's appointment would prove to be one of his best and most enduring appointments. I believe that the years have proved me right on that. Barbara was beloved by all. Sadly, she passed away in 2020. Joanne Marshall, my longtime Medical Library Association colleague, followed Barbara as dean in 1999. During her deanship, 
Seals became the first school to have its information science degree program accredited for a full seven years by the ALA. Dual master's degree programs were established with several campus units, including the Keenan Flagler Business School, the School of Public Health, and the School of Nursing. Classes began for the newly approved BSIS undergraduate degree program in 2003, and the international programs continued to flourish and expand. In 1999, while Joanne Marshall was dean, the U.S. News and World Report announced that SILS had received its first number one ranking. Jose Marie Griffiths became dean in 2004. While she was dean, she presided over an extremely successful 75th anniversary, bringing together many former deans and faculty, current faculty and students, and alumni from many graduating classes. Her major focus during her deanship was on external activities for the school and on fundraising. The Knowledge Trust and the Louis Round Wilson Society were both formed under her guidance. Barbara Moran returned as interim dean in 2009 during the period of the search for a new dean with the departure of Dean Griffiths. Under her unflappable and calm manner, the school continued to flourish and to move ahead. The 80th anniversary in 2011 coincided with a new dean in the school. Having Gary Marcianini as our dean for the past 10 years has given us the continued leadership that has been a hallmark of SILS since its founding in 1931. In 2011, he received the Award of Merit, which is the highest award that the American Society of Information Science and Technology gives. Under his leadership, several important events have taken place. SILS initiated the combination BSIS MS degree in 2012. In 2013, the important SILS Alumni Inclusion and Diversity Committee, the SAID Committee, was formed. It continues to, to function effectively today. In 2014, SILS received its largest continuation of the EPA contract which began under Dean Holly. That same year, a dual degree program in environmental informatics began. The Professional Science Master's Degree Program in Digital Curation was begun in 2017. This 100% online program was the first in the U.S. With support from several foundations, CTAP, the Center for Information, Technology, and Public Life was formed in 2019. The list of Gary's achievements and innovations in the school goes on and on, including his acceptance this year of a third term as dean. And now in 2021, we have come full circle. As I have looked back over these 90 years and some of our major achievements, it seems clear to me that we did indeed have a succession of leaders, deans, faculty, staff, and alumni, who moved us forward and successfully brought us to this point. Dr. Wilson provided the vision, and oh, so many individuals, giants if you will, moved that vision into the reality we know today. 
the superior past effort that brought about the initial number one ranking has been continued by our subsequent deans and faculties. Each deanship has made unique contributions to SILS and has sustained the high esteem in which SILS is held. The institutional memory has been passed on. Now former associate deans Barbara Wildemuth, Stephanie Haas, Ellen Thibault, Ron Berquist, and current associate dean Brian Sturm, along with deans Joanne Marshall and Gary Marchinini, and longtime staff members, hold the memories of the 1990s and the 2000s. Eventually, others will join them as keeper of the school's institutional memory. Thank you for indulging me as I have shared the Roper view of how we got from there to here, from Dr. Wilson's vision and persistence to the school's outstanding efforts during these 90 years that we have been in existence. We have a proud history and a bright future in front of us with our current distinguished faculty, staff, and dean. I'm convinced that some future look at the history of the school and at Gary's leadership will name him as one of our giants. I already consider him that. To paraphrase our alma mater, Sills is one of Carolina's priceless gems. <laughs>